Perfect. All right. My name is Joe. I'm sure you guys all know me very well. Um, so basically, I've been passionate about meteorology since I was like five years old. I'm pretty sure. And I'm gonna basically show you guys how badly I fried my own brain trying to learn everything I did. But the thing is about this field is if you're truly passionate, you have to ask yourself, what are you passionate about? Are you passionate about the money or are you passionate about the field, watching Mother Nature create and destroy? And that is what I saw. And it was when my first dog passed away before the blizzard of 2006, and they were forecasting 12 inches, and we got a three foot blizzard that pretty much shut down my town. So after that, I was really into it. I had an assumption that my dog's spirit made the storm enhance, but that's not. Okay. Well, yeah, maybe it did. Thank you. So, this is my weather Twitter page that I have over here. Um, it's about, I would say, one and a half years old, two years old. If you guys are interested on like keeping up with like winter weather and everything, um, my accuracy is around like 95 percent. This is the page you want to follow right here, Northeast Weather Authority. I pretty much show my bio over here that I don't hype, I don't try to rake in followers, I don't create clickbait. I'm straight up with a lot of people. And some people don't always agree with that because they want what they want, and that's not how Mother Nature works. So basically, before we're going over mid-latitude cyclones, and what I want to show you guys real quick is we're going to go over to this lovely Earth global map right over here. So we have over here our what? Who can tell me what this is? The waters here are very warm along the equator. We're learning about it in class. Just say it. 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 Say so basically, it's very important because forecasting, a lot of the people on TV um, don't have a degree in meteorology, so it'd be pretty deceiving on where you're getting your information from. But this is basically your regions over here. You have region, uh, region four through one. So basically, right now, what we're focusing is if you want a really harsh winter, you're going to want the Nina region locking in hot right over here. So what's going to happen is you're preventing convection over here if the waters are cooler. That subsides low pressure from rising. It creates high pressure. The Atacama Desert, right along in South America over here, stays dry. So what happens over here? All of this, what's going to eventually happen, right over here, you're going to have a concentration of warmer water. And we're going to go to our sea surface temperature anomalies. So if we go a little bit further over here into Nina region, Four, which is actually starting to weaken a little bit, and it's eventually going to shift right over here and concentrate. All of this convection, what's going to eventually happen is it's going to go up into the Gulf of Mexico. Now, you're going to have your subtropical jet and your polar jet become more active when that happens, and usually the sun will either come up the coast or go out to sea. So basically, what you guys are learning before with your ridges and troughs, we go back over here with rising you know, low pressure and sinking high pressure. This is very important, and I think this will be very good for them. Does anybody know why the waters over here are so cold right now? Can anybody take a wild guess? I'm going to give you a hint. Storms have been forming over here, all right? And they've been going up over here and exploding. When hurricanes go over warm water, what happens? If it's taking the heat out of it, it cools it off. Correct. So what's going to eventually happen? No, that's good. What's going to eventually happen is yeah. you're going to have all these cooler water anomalies kind of like wrap around Iceland and the Greenland Inlet area, and you're going to have high pressure form. What's going to happen? I will mark it over here. High pressure. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> That's fine. No, it's not fine. Okay. How do you this up? That's fine. No, it's not. Yeah, you do it all the time. I am not drunk. I mean, it's not. Yeah, don't do it anymore. But that one's mine. We're going to fix that. All right. I totally forgot about it. That's so in my lecture. Yeah. High pressure is going to form over there, all right? So if your jet stream is like this over here, 
what's going to happen over here? Low pressure. Okay. Now, right now on the west coast, it's very warm. You have a lot of storms going on over here. When this cooler anomaly forms, what's going to eventually happen over here is you're going to have a high pressure that's going to form. But low pressure, what you want for a bad winter, to be south of the Aleutian Islands. So if your jet stream is like, I'm going to try my best to do this, like this, what's going to happen on the west coast is that. High pressure here, low pressure here. The jet stream goes from west to east, and this is going to take all your lovely cold air in this area and it's going to attack it in here, which is going to happen this winter. Once the low pressures stop invading this area, high pressure is going to form here. And I'm going to give you guys a little sneak peek by winter outlook, kind of been tweeting to my followers and everything. My actual forecast did not come out to the 15th. You're in for a pretty rough one. Not cold-wise, but more so the storm-wise aspect of things. But if you guys are interested in following my weather Twitter page, this is it right here. Um, it is, I try to be the best I can in my ability and also educate people. I also have a lot of humor in my weather Twitter page. I'm not afraid to be myself. I think that you have to be yourself, but be professional and know your limit. So basically, I make, you know, videos. And what was very funny was a couple days ago, I'm not going to play the video, it's pretty long. Um, a couple days ago, what happens is every year with professionals or people just like me, you're going to have people that are going to say, oh, the winter is not going to be that bad. And they are going to fall in a category called cognitive dissonance. Does anybody here know what that means? Cognitive dissonance? Psychology majors at all, possibly? I've heard it before, but I can't Cognitive dissonance. So basically, cognitive dissonance plays out like this. So if somebody has a, a standpoint or a belief system, okay, they're going to do everything they can to protect it. This is our human nature. Let's say I come along and tell this person, well, this is not how you're going to forecast your winter outcome. And they're saying, oh, yes, this is, and I'm presenting actual, actual evidence that what I'm stating is true. By then protecting that belief system, that's called cognitive dissonance. It, it's our own like, defense mechanism from people trying to breach our own belief system. That's basically what it is. So what will happen is I will make a video like this and explain to people, little by little, that the reason why winter is not going to bust. And I put it in my video, and some people still don't believe that, and that's really the best you can do. But um, if you take, if anyone is interested, probably none of you guys are, if you want to go through this, you may also learn a lot of things that I'm learning, or you could probably use in class. Um, there was a guy a long time ago named Larry Cosgrove that I have right over here, and he used to be a broadcast meteorologist back in Cleveland. And at a young age, I think he was around like 45, 46, 47. He got off TV and he got into private sector meteorology. And if anybody knows what that is, the private sector meteorology, not the National Weather Service, you have people like Joe Bastardi of AccuWeather, that's a phenomenal forecaster. Unfortunately, I was not able to meet him when I did my broadcast on TV in AccuWeather. He left the company and he invested his money making his own company. And the reason why these private sector companies are better predictors than the National Weather Service is because you have to have a master's degree or higher and they're very strict with their policy. Where the National Weather Service, you can get a bachelor's, you can kind of get a position there. So Larry Cosgrove made his own company and it's Weather Nuclear International and um, Weather America. And what he's actually doing right now, he has a partnership with Chase Bank and a lot of corporate offices, even around in this area, because he lives in Hawkeye, Texas, Chase is going to raise their lease and see if they can afford it or not and kick them out and put their location like they did with Havana Central and Menlo Park Mall. You guys remember they were the champs over there? Same exact uh, thing. But he's been my mentor for a while and he's like a multimillionaire now. So this guy is a smart businessman, professional, and if you want to know about meteorology or if you really want to go far in this field, this guy right here will do it for you. Um, so I'm basically just like showing you guys, for example, well this, this, this would be great for them. I work out over here. So if we go back to our bridges and troughs, okay, I want to ask one of you guys a question. Why do you think that it is important for our November to be warm and us, for us to get a bad winter? Can you repeat the question? In November, because it's, you know, relatively warmer than it usually is, why do you think that it is important for that to happen, for us to get a bad winter? <laughs> well, by looking at this analog chart, anomalies of the bridges and you know the troughs, 
if we go back and look over, you know, it doesn't really come up that clear over here. November is right over here. January and February are these two months down over here. So basically, if you had, if we go back real quick, because this is what happened back in 2011 and 2012, and the reason why, especially the Weather Channel, they, did, they really crashed the burn on this forecast. And it, it's not exactly easy, because if you're going into meteorology, try and go into oceanography, earth science, because meteorology doesn't know everything. And I, I, I've learned that, I've, I, I've learned that. But what happened that year was this. People think when you have a warm ocean, that means it's gonna be a warm winter. That's not the case at all. Because when you have a warm ocean, you have low pressure constantly forming in the, water, the warmer waters. And what's gonna happen is you get this cold pocket over here south of Greenland, eventually high pressure pops here, and then you're really cold air with the storm. Now, when you have the cold and the warm air colliding in a certain area, where it's ultimately the thermal gradient, this is where you get your bad, bad snow bands, right along the shore, it's, it's that difference. So I remember someone that was a weather enthusiast was trying to ask me, but Joey, if the water is warm, doesn't that also make the coast warm? It does if you don't have an Arctic high right over here, spinning clockwise to the northeast. To the northeast. So because that you have that, it almost kind of acts like a barrier right over here and enhances snowfall. Here's what happened when in 2000, 2012, when there was no winter. The waters here were very cold. People were forecasting, oh, we have a cold ocean, we'll have to worry about rain mixing issues. There was a big problem with that. Because we had high pressure sitting over here, and high pressure is cooler than low pressure. So everyone was like, oh, we have a nice cold November. We had a little bit of snow. But the October snowstorm, that really crippling one, that was what really set it off. Now, up if you go back over here into Greenland, the waters here were not cold at all. And because you had no storms going through over here, the waters were not able to cool off. So being that the waters were warm over here, what happened? Low pressure constantly kept forming. If you have a low pressure in Greenland, the jet stream is the complete opposite and high pressure sits here. And that winter was a pretty much done deal. Did not happen. Uh, AccuWeather, the Weather Channel, even the National Weather Service crashed and burned. Uh, at that time, I didn't have a weather Twitter page, so I couldn't really tell people what I was seeing at the time. But that was a life lesson learned. Um, I can go a lot more into detail about this, but I think I've taught you guys within reasoning of what you're learning right now. And that's pretty much all I have to say, unless I have to teach another time. Um, can you just go through the Tell them about the figures that you're using, the Earth Viewer. Just show them the other little downloads on there. All like the different things it can yeah. do? Oh, absolutely. In case of absolutely. Thanksgiving break, they get excited. Absolutely. Like, oh, let me check the CO2 content. <laughs> well, real quick, mean sea level pressure. Um, the mean sea level pressure is indicative between purple, which is your lowest pressure, and your yellow, <laughs> which is your highest pressure. And as you can clearly see what I'm explaining to you guys is currently happening right now, you have your low pressures absolutely bombarding Greenland, Iceland, Reykjavik, Iceland, those areas. So what's going to happen is you're going to have the opposite. You're going to have a ridge over here. But look what's happening right over here. Okay. I have a piece of software that I tried to access on here, but the computer blocked me out. So I couldn't do it. But when you have high pressure forming up here in the North Pole, you're going to displace cold air. Another thing, I think you probably would, would like this as well, how the solar sun cycles, the monitor minimums, mm -hmm. the peaks between a lot of sun activity and no sun activity is very important because when you have a lower sun activity, what's gonna happen is that you're gonna have the stratosphere will begin to warm, also the sudden stratosphere forming event, and you're gonna displace this Arctic air and it's gonna tax out. And what happened last year was the polar vortex, the okay. brutal cold, because we had the values dropping, and it's still dropping right now, which strongly correlates to a very rough winter, that this winter is snow-wise and storm-wise is going to be a lot worse. And now, we go back over here. What can we show them? The, uh, oh. Here we go. Just a couple of screens, in case they miss us on Thanksgiving and they want to download it. 
Oh, if you go on like on my computer, I have like 150 plus links, so much data. That's nice when you can show them how it's coming off of the Sahara, all the dust. So this is um, the dust extinction right over here. Now this is kind of a little bit off topic, but I'll just go over it real quick. And I think I'm just going to cut the lecture short so you can teach the rest of the class. But during hurricane season, you don't want this. A hurricane will not enjoy sucking up dust or anything dry. But uh, in the winter time, you know, no one's ever made a study on it, and I want to get my researching license when I get my PhD, because I have a lot of theories when it comes to meteorology, and that's how you really blossom. But um, I feel that this is very important in the winter, and no one's ever said this, I'm doing this right off the bat. Because if all of this dust is really collecting yeast over here, that will suppress also storm development. That's my theory, at least. But um, that's all I'm really going to show you guys right now, because I don't want to fry your brains. So I'm going to let Claire take over. Do we have any questions for Joey? I have no one's Hopefully soon to be one day Dr. McMahon. Dr. McMahon, any questions? Hopefully not. Do you like the big globe? Did you say problems? Why would you say that? You have to have confidence. Not about confidence. I'm reading you guys right now. Who wants to ask me a question? I love answering questions. It's a challenge, like reverse psychology, if you think about it. Not as, Not as cold. Because if it's too cold, what's going to happen? It's going to be like this real quick. So if it's a warm winter, will it be a lot more snow? But a cold winter has less snow? It's very complex because weather is just not that simple. So I won't just Generally go. speaking. Though. Generally speaking, you really honestly can't answer your uh, like that at all. But what happened last winter, I think you guys remember we were supposed to get a really bad blizzard last winter, and it didn't happen. I want to, okay, good, that's very good. New England got pounded, and you know, it was funny because uh, a meteorologist's life was threatened. One of them was my mentor, Stephen DiMartino, of New York New Jersey Day Weather. Someone wanted to kill him. People are crazy. Um, you had the blizzard right over here, and the thing was, you had a brick wall of dry air, probably more like right there. So a kid on Long Island was killed and slammed into a pole by 75 mile power wind because he decided to go snow sledding. People's homes in New England were thrown into the ocean. Winds were pushing like 150 miles per hour, and this blizzard was, it could have done a lot of damage on the Jersey Shore, it could have shut down our towns for days, it would have been bad. We would have had wind damage, like almost almost similar to a hurricane, but because the trees grow in the opposing direction of a southeast wind, which is northwest, it's not as damaging. So if we go back over here, what was going on, right where Penn State University is, that where it's located, you had another storm forming right here. But at the same time, there was a high pressure system right here. So what was going on is you had it was the, they had like 14 inches of snow in like the Penn State University area. So if the air is rising over in this area over here, it's got to get moisture from other areas as well. Right in this area over here, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, it's all pretty much this. So basically, the blizzard comes in the blizzard bands. So I was watching it. I was so mad when I saw this. I was watching the blizzard, and it would like be just off the Jersey Shore, but it got stuck. I was so so mad. I told my parents like four or five hours in advance because I started to see it snow in Penn State. I'm like, uh oh, we're a trough. And then I was really pissed. But this winter, you really want to watch out because going back to the El Nino regions over here and that energy going into the Gulf of Mexico, you're gonna have a lot of storm tracks this year that are gonna drop into Southern California, Pineapple Express, the atmospheric river we learned about, and we'll go with Texas like this. Once it gets over here, usually that's where your polar jet stream and your subtropical jet stream like the phase. This is when you also get your phase and going on. Now, there's another jet stream as well, which is also the Pacific that comes across like this, and if you get a triple phaser, you don't want so my concern is, because we're not going to have to deal with as much this year of the possibility of inverted troughs, because the high pressure systems are not going to come far enough <laughs> south to um, keep the storms away from us. Because what happened also that winter, which really got me mad many times before, good job, Jeff. The high pressure systems and the Arctic bitter air was like, yeah, a high pressure system right here, and you have a big barrier right here. So a lot of the storms, kept on kind of meandering like that. 
and slamming South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia to Appalachian with snow and ice. I remember last year, this was this was insane. Tennessee had one of the worst ice storms, and the U.S. is like worst ice storm on yeah. record. They had like an ice buildup. Like if I took within hours too. It, it was took. catastrophic. It was destructive. I think the ice was like this thick. It was like a couple inches. It was crazy. It was absolutely insane. But that's pretty much all I'm going to teach you guys. I think if I go any further, it would be a bit confusing. If Claire wants to let me teach next time, I can go and write that at all. That's pretty much it. I have nothing else I can say. You could say that, but if you look at the effects on hurricanes and being that the eye and the source of low pressure system is basically its, its life source, when you monitor a lot of hurricanes, you have um, the open circulation and closed circulation. So with Hurricane Joaquin, luckily it did not come in New Jersey. And I remember watching that storm and I know the reason why that didn't happen. But it had a closed circulation, so this dust could not go into the center of the circulation and pretty much rip it apart. So, like I said, this is more of a theory of mine. So I believe if you had a low, a low pressure system formed and the dust got into the open circulation, it would pretty much kill it from the center circulation and then rip it apart from the outer edge. But it's still a theory. It was never proven. I'm a rebel with these kinds of things, but you have to have dust to go outside of your comfort zone. I would like to prove that one day. I have to actually watch this winter and see if that dust has any effect on any low pressure system. So if I see a storm is starting to fall apart, but the waters are warm and it's acting like steroids, and I see some dust getting in, and it goes right into center of circulation, and it weakens the storm and raises the middle of pressure, then I may be on something. That's it. I really don't have anything more to say.